Sean Patwell is the CEO and founder of CW8 Communications. Prior to forming the company in 2018, Sean was the global head of communications at aircraft leasing giant Avalon. He advises global technology leaders, NGOs, governments and corporate players the world over. He spent over 10 years in Asia advising many of the world's leading brands and has advised on some of the largest M&A transactions in Asia. A seasoned crisis communications advisor, Sean has also advised many leading corporations and governments through rapid response and crisis and issues preparedness and management. An award-winning communications expert, Sean also served as the vice chairman of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and the Pearl River Delta of Macau and Guangzhou. Sean holds a master's degree in global diplomacy from the School of Oriental and African Studies in, from the University of London. Sean Patwell, welcome to the Life Lab. Thank, thank you for being here. You look fabulous. <laughs> thank you for having me. You I'm look amazing. To be here. Thank this you. outfit is gorgeous. What <laughs> what brand is this? This is actually uh, Prada. Um, head to Prada actually today, um, which is just a nice little number. So I said I'd bring the style. You definitely brought the, the style. You definitely. It has to match the occasion. You brought it in abundance. You look amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it's um, it's kind of a, a opportune day because we're in a new studio for the Life Lab <laughs> because of Jitex. Yes. It's all booked up, but this one is really nice. It's a nice and change. Two Irish people. We have to bring green. We did. Yeah. Actually, that's so weird. We, we both we're both wearing green. It's our it's our spirit. It's we the spirit it, color. We didn't plan that. <laughs> as if anyone <laughs> is wondering, that's just a coincidence. But yeah, that's true. So you're you're here back in the region yes. for a little bit. So Sean, I wanted to start with the fact that you have lived and worked across three continents, um, and just to tell us a bit about how you ended up and you know going to those parts of the world for your career. Absolutely. So I'm Sean uh, and I am originally from a very small town in West Cork called Clonakilty. Okay. Um, but my backstory is I'm from this fabulous large family, but I'm actually adopted. And as an adopted child, I learned very young that I had heritage from um, Asia. Okay. Uh, from Middle East, South Asia, broadly speaking. So as a child, I became obsessed with travel and curiosity and I dreamt about leaving Ireland and going to connect with my roots a little bit and had, hitting the road. And, uh, and, and the minute I got the opportunity, I was determined to study languages, culture, um, which led me to university in Limerick in Ireland, where I did European studies initially. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I could get to Madrid on my Erasmus, I was able to take up Arabic. And so I was able to do Arabic wow. as part of my undergraduate degree. Very briefly, I wouldn't say that I'm fluent and I'm certainly not conversational anymore. But it was this type of, I suppose, this search for identity that really led me on that journey to leave Ireland. Be um, yeah, And that was because you were told that your birth parents were from the Middle East. My birth father, yeah. Your birth exactly, father. Exactly, yeah. And I was very much encouraged to know that uh, insofar as the information we had. Yeah. So actually as a child, I had a huge map of the Caspian region as it was. I got it from the National Geographic hanging in my bedroom. And I suppose it was seared in my mind that I would one day live in Asia. Okay. Um, and I suppose broad brush, I'm saying Asia, because actually all the places I ended up living in weren't just limited to the Middle East. I, I went to many other places. So when I graduated from university, it was kind of the the tail end of the Western version of the global financial crisis, which was kind of 2008 and 2009. Mm. It was really hard to find a place to work, even as an intern, um, anywhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept getting rejected. Um, and so I found an agency called Grayling. And uh, I wasn't successful in getting through to their, their office in Brussels. But I decided I'd call their office in Singapore. And I called up the office. The lady answered the phone and I, I said, hey, I'm Sean. I'd, I'd love to come and work with you guys for an internship. She said, we have no opening. Sorry, bye. Hung up. I was like, oh, let's try again. Waited a couple of days, call back again. And I said, um, hi there, can you put me through to Chris, please? It's Sean from the Dublin office. Oh, absolutely, I'll put you through to Chris right now. I said, oh, Chris, I'm so sorry. I think the lady at the front desk thinks that I'm calling from um, your Dublin office. I, I actually, I'm an intern who's looking for work, recently graduated, and I'm going to work for free if you'll have me. And he said, well, 
that's an offer I can't refuse. Oh my God, that's such a good <laughs> story. You're pretty cheeky. Yeah. So that's, it takes balls to do that. Exactly. Yeah. I, I just, it was just to get out into, into, into the workforce. Just get your foot in the door. Totally. Yeah. And and I, I joined a team in Singapore that was just the kindest group of account directors, account executives, consultants. So you moved from Ireland yeah. to Singapore as d- an intern. D- didn't even wait for my graduation. I l- literally finished my exams on a Friday. And by Monday, I was working in Singapore um, and I was on a you know basic intern salary of around 10 Singaporean dollars per day. But what actually happened during that time was I was able to like work across a range of accounts um, from British Airways to Diageo to Rolex to BlackRock Asset Management. And it was just the perfect foundation to get to get rolling. Now, Singapore did pique my interest, but I was like, wait a minute, I've got this degree in in European studies and Spanish. Um, and I used the opportunity to get a role with Edelman back in, in Europe. And I was able to hop back to Europe quite quickly. Um, worked there in the technology team across 36 markets, which was, again, just amazing. I worked with this fantastic man called Roger Darisha, who taught me so much about the world of PR, still is a mentor to me today. Um, did that for a little while, but I was still kind of itchy feet and I was so determined. I said, I, I need, I said, I'm going to spend a decade traveling, uh, traveling with purpose, actually, and working in as many different cultures as I possibly could. And then came along an amazing opportunity to move to Abu Dhabi and work in um, a, with a lady called Sarah Bartlett um, in Weber Shandwick um, and Ziad Hasbani. And I got to work on amazing clients across Abu Dhabi government um, and kind of, I suppose, financial institutions across the UAE. So I was able to kind of tap into this Middle Eastern heritage that I felt so strongly mm. about and got to dip my toes. Um, that led me to doing working in another agency that has completely rebranded now, but it was called Capital MSL up here in Dubai. And I even got to work with a company called Dabo as well, which got kind of um, absorbed into Edelman. Yeah. But I got to work with phenomenal people um, th- during that period of time in the Middle East and worked in a very interesting time too because the Arab Spring started, yeah, there was a lot of change, yeah. things were shifting constantly in the region um, and I think, you know, I do credit the time that I was in this region as probably one of the most important chapters of the international aspect of my career mm. because I learned so much about emotional intelligence, mm-hmm. understanding where people come from and the perspective that brings into their day-to-day lives in a multicultural setting. Um, so when I got to the end of my time in in Dubai, I, I said, wait, there's just one more stint in Asia that I really need to get out of my out of my system. And that was to live and work in North Asia in Hong Kong and I jumped then to go work for FTI Consulting in Hong Kong, working across all of North Asia, Japan, Korea, um, China, um, right down to lower Asia Pacific as well. And, you know, I got to work with their capital Mm -hmm. markets team, which really kind of rounded out my professional experience and was able to move from kind of a generalist to more of a subject matter expert Mm -hmm. on all things to do with financial communications. That's amazing. And yeah. you got you worked your way up quite to very senior I roles did, in I Asia, did. right? I did. And actually, do you know what? Like, I wouldn't recommend that. I was like, I pushed myself so hard. I was constantly pursuing the promotion. Every opportunity I could get, I was like leveraged to get up to the next step. And my biggest regret at that moment in time was that I didn't actually get the time to enjoy, you know, staying in a role for a couple of years and actually mm. learning what it's like to just be. Yeah, I was always consumed with next. The next, next, next. Yeah, and it was, and it was another interesting time. Like that, that time in in Hong Kong, I arrived. It was during the Occupy Central um, period of time. So I kind of arrived in, and there was like protests throughout the city center. And so, kind of, we were always helping clients. I think that's a theme that worked throughout that ten year period, which mm. was helping clients navigate that, changing environments. Yeah, you know, which obviously came in really handy with, when you started your own. PR consultant. Totally, firm. totally. I did I did do one stint in house. I was lured to work for one of our clients, um, Donald Slattery, who's one of the biggest aviation uh, oh. entrepreneurs in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, he convinced me to come and work for him. It didn't take much convincing, actually, but he offered me the opportunity to be global head of communications and branding. Now I wasn't even 30. That's amazing. But, but it was it was a forty billion dollar company. It was a it was a ticket back home to Ireland. Um, and I got to work in aviation, finance, culture. We had this amazing artistic residency award that we did, um, gave out to artists from all over the world and brought wow. them to Dublin. We, um, it involved everything from putting on events for 
aviation CEOs all over the world to even bring a Broadway musical for the first time ever to Dublin. That's amazing. So so you went from Hong Kong back to Ireland for that role? Correct. So correct. how long did you spend in Hong Kong? I spent just over three years there. Three years. Yeah. And then you moved back to Ireland back for that to, global comms. Right? Correct. But I wasn't in Ireland that much because we were obviously in the business of buying, selling, leasing aircraft. Mm. Um, and so I was working directly for the CEO, which was just an amazing opportunity to be right next to, well, one of Ireland's biggest entrepreneurs, greatest sure. entrepreneurs by, by any measure. Um, and I was able to just, you know, shadow him mm. and learn from him. And um, I think at a certain point in time, I said, being in-house wasn't for me. Um, and actually, I love the hustle of wheeling and dealing with journalists, working yeah. with reporters. When you go in-house, I suppose maybe the stakeholder list kind of narrows slightly. Dwindles a bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. And, and that's a very specific skill set. Mm -hmm. I am very good... And I was very good throughout my career at being able to work across a number of things simultaneously. Um, it, it excited me, I suppose. Yeah. So I went to him one day and I said, do you know what? I said, I really want to start my own agency and I want to do it a little bit different to what's already out there. Um, and he said, I support you 100 percent. and I'll be your first client. That's that's a pretty big, you know, um, endorsement if your employer is saying oh, that. Hundred percent. And yeah. so that was so that was kind of what inspired you then to to you know become a founder and start CWA Communications. Yeah, and 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 it it was more than that. I suppose. Look, I had been through so many agencies, and I actually, to be honest, it's not that I'd focus on any negatives. No. Yeah. I saw some really fantastic things in all the agencies that I worked for. And I also saw some things that could be improved. Mm. So I wanted to design an agency that was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever you hire a PR firm, normally like you're you're discussing about like the scope of work and you're talking about the markets and et cetera, et cetera. I said I want to offer a global firm that offers global media relations, global um, strategic advisory. communications advisory. And we didn't think of the world by markets or by regions because I suppose I had a little bit of I had trust in myself and confidence in myself that, you know, I did actually know journalists on the ground in mm -hmm. key geographies around the world mm -hmm. that I could pick up the phone mm -hmm. and I could actually reach out to somebody, even if I was in Europe mm -hmm. and they were in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I had meaningful connections. Yeah. Um. So I also wanted to build an agency in Dublin initially, kind of rooted a little bit in Dublin because there wasn't an agency like this no. that I could have worked for. I had to go and work for free in Singapore to try and get myself up and running. Right. So I said, how about this? Why don't I create an agency around emerging technology? Because these technology companies are not thinking by market. They're thinking globally. They have a global vision. They have a global need. Um, they need people to be able to support them on a range of things, not just binary items yes. that, that you know you might sell as services, but a flexible partner that's an extension of their team. Think kind of a chief marketing officer meets chief communications exactly. officer as a service. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what we were able to do was to very quickly identify some new technologies that were kind of gathering pace. And I was able to discover blockchain. Okay. And that led us into the first pillar of work that really has carried us through the last five years, working at the very... Uh, height of that industry with some of the best developers across Ethereum, et cetera. Um, as a client? As clients, yeah. We've worked with them all over the world. The, you know, there's been major, major, major companies that we've been able to work with. Blockchain clients. Correct. And across the entire life cycle of what we now call Web3. Wow. And that was just one thing. And that was just when it was nascent then. Totally. Most people didn't understand. It was kind of the, it was, it was the first crypto winter. Okay. And so that was kind of 2017, 2018. And so it was actually a really interesting time because there was a bit of consolidation um, and there was need for advice. And th some of these founders needed advice and support. And we started off really small. We mm -hmm. started off really small, really flexible with them in terms of how we worked with them. We understood as well, you know, as a lot of companies at the beginning don't have a huge amount of money to invest no. in this. But I fundamentally felt that CW8 what it stands for is actually Causeway 8 Communications and it had to, has to be shrunk because nobody wants to hear what Causeway 8 <laughs> Communications is. But for a second, we wanted to work with cause focused founders because we believe cause is the only way forward. And I suppose in, in a sense, having lived in Asia, eight being the infinity number, I said it was kind of a magical kind That's of twist. That's my lucky number as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I'm the youngest of eight. 
So oh I said, you know what, this is cool. Shrink it down, CW8, no one needs to know the meaning. But the meaning was important to me and to the initial members of my team mm. because we realized that there was these game-changing founders who had these ideas and they needed to help navigate how they could build awareness of what they were doing and quite literally build trust in it when people are a bit distrustful of new mm, things. Mm -hmm. And that brought us together to our organizing principle, which is that we build trust in mm -hmm. new ideas. Yeah, that's the tagline it is, of, the, it is. of your agency. How, how do you think, I mean, how do you do that nowadays with with kind of how quickly emerging technologies are happening and, and even in the pure space? What What's the ethos? How do you implement that ethos with your clients? It's it's incredible. It's, it's it's I suppose first and foremost, it's about investing in dialogue with mm -hmm. a range of stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, and it's about sitting down with people to help them understand topics. So quite literally, like it shouldn't be of any surprise, but going and you know s arranging literally lunch to mm -hmm. explain to journalists what? Um, what the technology means and use cases so they become a bit more comfortable about it. What we found at the beginning days of kind of what is now Web3 blockchain was that the editorial desks were quite overwhelmed trying to cover this topic, especially with a range of things where it could be like the speculation around currencies right across to scandals, right across to technology protocols that were being built or mm -hmm. corporate use cases. It was a lot of jargon. And we had to simplify it significantly. And then you also have a lot of companies that succeed and companies that fail through the process. And the journalists were genuinely struggling to kind of get their head around all of these topics very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, my, our approach was that we would go to the reporters. We'd organize kind of sit down lunches off the record, ask, ask us whatever questions you want with subject matter experts and be a resource to them okay. so that they could understand it. And I think just, you know, a journalist shouldn't trust someone automatically. No, that's not you their know, job. Yeah, That's not their job. But the more time you meet someone, the more time you look at them eye to eye, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. more you get a measure of the person. And the more you trust them. Exactly. Because you've got that relationship with exactly. them. Exactly. And I think that that, I suppose, with even the relationships that I had with journalists around the world mm -hmm. were so pivotal at that initial period because they would take a meeting with me to meet my clients because they did have that trust with, you, with yeah. me because I had been with them at different moments in their career. Of course, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There's one, so true. There's one reporter at the Wall Street Journal and pr she and I have pretty much lived and worked in all the different places that I've mentioned. At the same time. In and around the same time. And I've kind of gone up around the same team. The, the themes that she covers are completely different to what they were then. But we were able to kind of, you know, be supportive to one another to help them understand um, you know, different industries introduced to different people as we moved around the world. Same with a couple of journalists that I worked with at Reuters as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it was, it's quite, it's quite beautiful to see how, you know, everyone's career is a tapestry mm -hmm. and it's really about connecting the dots. Mm. And we were able to kind of, you know, connect all these dots to be of use to our clients. Um, right. And that global service offering was quite central. So we didn't just stop there. We, we actually worked with um, the world's largest provider of mobile top-up um, prepaid. It was called Zing. It was an amazing company that was founded here in Dubai, um, which basically simplified, um, you know, the exchange of data and airtime for, for, for migrant workers. Okay. Um, an incredible company. Um, another locally grown business that I was, I've just been so honored to work with and, um, and, and to learn from as well is Pure Harvest. Pure Harvest are amazing. <laughs> yes. And Sky Kurtz, um, who I've known for a very long time, um, has been an anchor client of ours. Well, just for people that might yeah. not know, I mean, I think most people in Dubai know what Pure Harvest is because it's in pretty much every supermarket, but tell, tell us a bit. Sure. About yeah. So Pure Harvest is a, um, Controlled environment agriculture company. Um, it is. It, it basically has allowed the UAE and many other countries to um, grow fruit and vegetable in a, in in an environment our that we couldn't. Desert climate, an, yeah, yeah, in an arid de desert environment that we couldn't have done before, and, and they um, taste delicious, <laughs> outstanding, yep. and it's better than organic because mm. they're they're just phenomenally produced year round production, which was really important to us because I think you know climate was becoming quite top of mind as I was starting the company, mm. like it they disintermediate 
a certain percentage of food that has to be flown in here. Of course. You know, we are, we're all aware at how fragile the food security infrastructure is After in, this, in, in, this, in this part of the world where it's very hard to grow fruit and vegetable mm. and uh, fruit and vegetables, sorry. And uh, they have built a, an incredible business, um, which is truly addressing a massive addressable need in the market. Um, but not just that, but actually really producing product that is delicious. Delicious. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it, Sky is just one of those those founders that um, you're you're just really lucky to have met and get to work with. We've been working with him now for five years. I've known him for longer, um, but but it's just amazing because when you're working on public relations, you know, efforts, you know, it's great to have a founder who's so engaged in the process mm. and understands. That's so important. Yeah. I mean, if you don't, if they're not engaged, it's so hard to help them. Totally. But I think what about Pure Harvest is interesting is it really, it's a great case study for what your agency does because, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I, I knew about Pure Harvest before I realized you were doing their PR and I knew what they, I understood kind of the technology and how they were helping address food sustainability here in the region. I mean, it's a great example of how, uh, you know, effective PR and like good strategic communications can help a client reach across, you know, bigger stakeholder groups. Definitely. And it has helped shine a light on the innovation that is actually happening here in the GCC. Mm. I mean, actually, I believe that in the hardest environments, the greatest innovation can emerge. That is so true. Yeah, and they are that they are. I think mm. honestly, if not the the standard bearer of that, um, and I look at cities. You know what? Like what, what really excites me is as I look at the company as as we continue to grow. We're five years in business this month, um, and that should be a moment of like, yay, we're five years in business. It's fantastic. Actually, like you're never kind of at peace with the status of your startup. Um, you're constantly looking for next. Mm. What is next? What is going to be the next topic? And, you know, I won't name clients, but we are we're moving into areas around space. We're moving into areas around artificial intelligence. Um, uh, just new areas that show that learning what we've done in, in some of the sectors we've worked in so far, we're championing founders who have bold ideas. That's uh, and just on the AI topic. I mean, it's it's a really interesting one when it comes to the world of public relations, right? Because, you know, with as AI is, um, you know, reaching more, that technology is helping more businesses, and and then you have deep fakes and you know augmented reality. How do you think that's going to affect, you know, how pure agencies will have to serve their clients as, you know, deep fakes and AI becomes more prevalent and causing, you know. Pro kind of problematic for for clients in the future i think we have to explore the tools and see how they can help us do our work more efficiently mm -hmm. um my greatest concern is that younger members of our industry who are fresh out of college will rely on them too heavily mm -hmm. um and what i I'm, I'm trying to build with my team is critical thinking and you know, you can have the best tools in the world, mm -hmm. but if you don't know how to ask the right questions, questions, well, that's pointless. Like journalists can't be replaced. No. They can't. No. Um, now, there was one case I heard where, um, you know, a bunch of um, wire journalists actually asked um, ChatGPT to write questions for a specific CEO of a specific global asset manager. And at the same time, the journalists wrote down the list of questions that they would like to know based on covering that particular company. Okay. And they were astounded by what types of questions that... Why was that? Just, they were they different? Well, they were, so, they were so accurate. They were so kind of, because it had kind of gone into historical reports by that, on that particular individual and what they had said previously and kind of asked what might be the next question to ask them as a follow-on. Mm. Now, I don't think that um, it is to be feared, it's to be embraced to a certain degree. But I do think that the art form of communication is literally what we are doing right now. Mm, it's, it's the face to face humans, piece, hundred yeah. percent. And of course, COVID changed things, and we adapted. But like, look how quickly the world has come back, mm. and how in central face to face in person meetings. I mean, I was at Jitex this yeah. week for those internationally. Jitex is this incredible. Um, what, well, it started off like a PC show years yeah, ago. Yeah, and it's now, now it's the, like the biggest technology <laughs> event in yeah, the world, basically. It's amazing. It's, it's absolutely mammoth. There's no substitute for meeting face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. There's no substitute for critical thinking and intelligent writing mm -hmm. and um, and creative storytelling. 
you know, we can use all the tools we want in the world, I said, but the human touch is what qualifies it. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, again, use it, experiment with it. You'd be foolish not to. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do believe that our our industry bodies are coming up with standards to kind of guide and and, and kind of, you know, say what are the standards of using these tools. Um, But from our perspective, you know, I, I... don't even like documents being, you know, started based off of another one. I like them to be started Fresh. from scratch. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree with you about that. I mean, I think they're definitely not to be feared, like you said, and and that they can um, they can enhance what we're doing. But I I kind of do fear for kind of younger people coming up in the industry that you know will not know how to draft a document from scratch or like do re- you know they'll just rely on it too much because. It, I think the results of something when you've done it from the very beginning, you know, it's like if some if you're making a cake, if somebody did the mix, it's not going to be exactly the same as if you did it with your own hands from scratch. You know, every it affects kind of everything about it. 100%, so I yeah. think you know that's really important that people. Still yeah, and I think just look, you know, we can always work smarter. You yeah, know, there's always going to be a bit of mm-hmm. a bit of that. Um, but I do think like one trend that we're seeing is that I think a lot of people are using it for writing their LinkedIn copy. And I think it is actually impacting the engagement um, of, you know, the actual posts that are going up there because there has been a sudden. You mean the, those posts are more prevalent or. Well, I think there's people have been relying on it. And I, I think it's throwing, you know, the LinkedIn side. I'm not, I'm not an expert yeah, yeah, on this, sure. but, but it is things are beginning to look quite samey. Yes, I know. What you mean. And I yeah. think I've been a bit, a little bit suspicious about it. Now, I'm yeah. not, this isn't a, an engineering discussion, yeah. but I have noticed um, a kind of standardization of posts and, uh, yeah. and from different, you know, people I follow and connect with. So I think we do need to be careful that it doesn't become a sea of nothing, you yeah. know, and that we we still try to put intelligent, intelligent and insightful content out there mm-hmm. and forget that we are here to express opinions. We are here to express thoughts and mm. share ideas, you mm-hmm. know, and no technology um, is going to replace that, I don't think. Mm. That's really interesting, especially for you running this, you know, a firm that specializes in emerging pure for emerging technologies. Yeah. Um, what uh, what are you most excited about with emerging technologies in this industry? I think it's 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 the the, the most the, the parts that I'm really excited about is how technologies can transform lives. Mm-hmm. Um, major major urban cities like Sao Paulo, Ciudad de México, Bangkok, cities in Ch- in China, cities mm-hmm. in India. These are the places where some of the best innovation will come out of because they have probably the biggest challenges in day to day living. Um, I'm most excited around how the interplay of tools around AI, like for example, in financial services, there's an awful lot of clunky, boring work that is produced by analysts up and down Wall Street that could be done better, faster, and allow them to free up their time to do more interesting work, uh, more creative stuff even. Um, There is an opportunity as well to um, see how, you know, we can explore new areas of the world, like deep sea mm-hmm. uh, looking into space mm-hmm. things that were just never done before there's a company <coughs> excuse me there's a company in uh, california called spin launch that is looking to launch satellites into space at a much more ec- economical and more environmentally friendly pace wow. than any of the other rocket propelled um, satellite oh. launch companies out there so we're going to mm-hmm. see all sorts of really interesting examples of companies that are going to fundamentally change how our world operates and I think yes we are confronted with a massive climate challenge Mm -hmm. but uh, uh, parallel to that we have these incredible people working tirelessly to find solutions to those problems working together and I think the pandemic was a great example of how the world did unite so I'm an optimist about how technology can be uh, bring people together Mm -hmm. rather than divide. Uh, For your personal growth how do you ensure that you stay ahead I mean you're you're in the public relations industry, specializing in emerging technologies and obviously expanding a bit. What do you do for you to make sure that you're kind of on the top? I, so I I think one of the things that was always really important to me was that no matter where I left, whether I was unhappy in a job or or whatever, Mm. I still kept in touch with, um, you know, my boss or colleagues in those companies. And throughout the the last five years, Mm. I turned to them just for some informal advice and check-ins. And they've been just so, so generous to me throughout the period of time. There's a few standout, Fran McElwain, who led 
um, Hill and Knowlton Middle East for many, many years, um, continues to be Amazing. an integral part of, of our team. Actually, she comes over and trains my team still, in, oh, though she's wow. in semi-retirement. Um, Christine Wood as well as FTI Consulting. I turn to all these people and I I get a um, I get to take a bit of a pulse check about how they might handle, you know, different things about, you know, how to build a team or how to motivate mm-hmm. them or or so forth. Um in a peer setting, truthfully, I haven't actually had, because we're in Dublin and because we're doing such different type of work. Now, we do work in the middle. We have a company here in the Middle East as well. Um, but we very much have been flying in, flying out. And I, I, you know, I think we will expand our presence here because we have such great clients here who actually mm-hmm. need it, um, need the support. We, you know, I find actually when I come back to Dubai, it's pretty incredible that nearly every person that I was friends with mm. is an entrepreneur. Really? Yeah. And I think actually in all the countries that I've lived and worked in, including my home country, that is absolutely not the case. So today I've had back to back coffees with around six other founders and my God, how generous they are. Like they, the, the advice they give freely without expectation um, we have a WhatsApp group, you know, we have, mm. you know, a brotherhood of founders, you know, we wow. have, we have a sisterhood of founders. We <laughs> have so many different, different groups and, um, and all in their own way, you know, there's, there's, uh, Amina Gr- Grimman, who yeah. is a founder of Powder Beauty. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, Omar Al-Sharif as well, who has launched a, a kind of a, a neobank verity. Mm-hmm. I get to catch up with all of these these individuals and, you know, we're, we're all kind of experiencing different challenges, challenges and we provide a different level of support to each other um, throughout throughout our careers. And I think that's what lifts me up. Um, and I think lifting up is a really important theme is to surround yourself with people who you actually you. champion you. Mm. Um, and and, you know, there are people who don't understand why you do what you do and they don't they're not familiar with your world. That's OK. But I suppose fundamentally, I when I see a, a fellow entrepreneur, I'm rooting for them mm-hmm. um, because I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have to be the bearer of responsibility and to um, to kind of have to make these decisions that, you know, often are you can, can be quite a lonely place. At Definitely times. a lonely place. Yeah. What were some what were one or two key moments that you feel prepared you to become a founder So I think, honestly, I was an autopilot when I decided once I make up my mind, I was going to do it. Um, It was really funny. I thought I would go off and take three or four months and backpack around South America. And I lasted eight days before I was doing an RFP. And I was back in back in Europe, you know, pretty quickly pitching to win what was, you know, my second client because I already had my previous employer as my first. Um, I would say that some of the challenges of that uh, initial period was there was imposter syndrome around you know we didn't necessarily have all the things that a big company might have yeah so how did we build trust with the clients that they knew that we could handle their mandate deliver on a project and actually do it to a standard that was higher than anyone and that that was my ultimate focus for that entire first period I was I was almost consumed with it um you know I was you know, our first major projects were working around the World Economic Forum in Davos. That's incredible that yeah. those were your first projects. They major were, pro- they were. And it's I was just... like there with the, you know, I, I, the first opportunity that we got to go, I was there with a startup. We, they, I didn't know whether we could actually get them the interviews that they wanted. And I said, you know what, in case that we can't get them interviews, I'm going to bring my own video camera and a tripod and I will interview them on the spot with the snow, snow drop background Brian. on the mountains um, and those videos were amongst the best viewed videos that that company had um, in the history of that company because wow. it was just like it showed them that these founders were at a serious level meeting with important stakeholders. And that was the kind of effort. It was just like we had to do everything possible to make sure that we could deliver what we could for the clients to mm-hmm. the highest, highest level. Now, I suppose the hardest period initially um was we were only 18 months into the company mm-hmm. and I had paid out bonuses. I was like, this is amazing. We've had a profitable first year. It's been fantastic. We paid out bonuses, um, I think, on the 16th of March um, 2020. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And obviously, oh, the God, next then. few days later, we were in the pandemic. And then I was like, oh, my God. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Because I was wondering so much of um, our work was global. So much of our companies were startups. Some of them are startups. So um, we were see- experiencing a material change in how the world worked. And it was a pretty sobering <laughs> a couple, of, yeah. couple of weeks. And I just had to kind of go into uh, kind of the, you know, kind of crisis mode, mode in myself and say, whoa, one week you're like doling out bonuses. The next week you're like, oh, wait a minute. One minute. Will, will we survive? Yeah. Um, and I shifted my m- mentality completely and I said, you know what, it isn't about us, it's about our clients. It is about my team, of course, and reassuring them. Um, but I made sure to be so intimately aligned with what was going on for my clients in those moments. So I was on the phone to them on a daily basis, reaching out to them, checking in. How was the internal dynamic of these changes af- impacting them? What, how are they figuring out working from home with the kids in the background, mm. all of this kind of stuff. So we actually got closer to our clients during that period of time. And we actually grew 100% in that year, that That's first amazing. year. But I think it was because we all pivoted so quickly. Mm. And I believed we did not have the right to operate. We did not have the right to succeed. So there, therefore, any challenge would have come against us in that second year. There was no, there was no reason why my company should survive. So therefore, I had to fight for it anyway. You know, I think if you were established and you had something to say, well, we've been in business for X number of years, Mm -hmm. then you'd be shocked then if this happened and you didn't survive it. But we were just only 18 months in at that stage. And I said, well, I had absolutely no right to guarantee that my second year of business would be anything like the first year. So let's just roll with it and see what happens. And um, we were able to find the right level of, of fee to charge clients the right level of support to provide for them, whether it was facilitating Zoom calls, Zoom interviews, all of these different mm-hmm. things that we we learned very quickly to get used to. Um, but it was a a rapid, rapid kind of wrapping our arms around mm-hmm. our stakeholders and, and it, it did pay off. And you you survived and more, thrived. More actually. so, yeah, yeah, more so. And and it was hard. I like I think back to um some of the the youngsters, I, I call them, you know, fresh grads who were working for us. You know, the resilience that they had, I, like if I had been, you know, Sean in Singapore, if that had happened to me. You would have been scared. And my plans, yeah. my plans had been scuppered. Mm. I would have been really upset. Mm. You know, I just felt I, and I, I I meet people still today. And, and I, I think, you know, just because we've come out relatively strong out of that environment, mm. every environment is challenging. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've met people in other industries who have lost, you know, two years of their professional life. And I, I, you know, so you can't just think, whoa, we made it. There's a lot of people who suffered incredibly and and lost a lot of people too, you know, a hundred percent. So I think it's, you know, being compassionate is a very central theme to how we work and how I work with my clients. And And how you build trust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And, and we, we, we must never lose sight of that because I think that's. Empathy and compassion. Totally. So pivotal. And um, Sean, I, like at this, the the kind of ethos of this podcast is about you know we're trying. I'm trying to elicit wisdom from from people like you who've achieved something remarkable on what they felt led most to their success. Are there what was some advice or any maybe key mentors that that, that shared wisdom with you that you felt helped lead to you know the success in your career? I think. Being a gentle presence um, is very important as an, as an advisor. Being a gentle presence. Yes. Um, I think as particularly as Irish people, we have a very different perspective on the world um, in the sense that we tend to, we don't always tend to be the, say, the loudest in the room. Um, we don't. We don't no. necessarily, no. We don't impose our viewpoint on how we do things in our capital in Dublin, we don't come into a room and say, this is how you do that and this is how you do this. We reason with people and we listen. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think that is why there's been a, you know, Ireland's neutrality has actually been a very central piece to our identity and why uh, you'll find some extremely successful people at the top of many organisations around the world of Irish heritage, um, because we do have a way of building coalitions uh, building alliances with stakeholders and um, 
and our ultimate objective, basically because of our mommy, our mommies and daddies taught us to never offend mm-hmm. people and to be polite. And the values that we have are really, really central to who we are. So there's a kind of a, a tome that that was used in, in, in Avalon, the company I worked in, um, which was we take what we do very seriously, but we don't take ourselves very too seriously. seriously. And I think it's that joie de vivre, so to say, the balance of those two things, mm-hmm. um, which helps us as we go around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is that has st- stayed with me. Um, another one is about dealing with the facts. Um, that's another one that comes from my old boss, Donal, dealing with the facts because everything else is fiction. Mm-hmm. And especially in a moment of crisis, that's what you have to ascertain. Dealing with the facts. Yeah. That's very good because yeah. it's easy to get um, carried away with all yeah. sorts of distractions in a crisis. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And, you know, I think it's it's important to acknowledge that, you know, there will always be good times, but there will be challenging times. Mm-hmm. And nothing should surprise you, mm. you know, about, especially in those circumstances. And as communication practitioners, um, the quality of what we do should stand the test of time. That's why technology cannot replace anything. I had a fabulous catch up with um, another one of my mentors today, Elizabeth McLean, who was the head of communications um, at Fly Dubai for many years. And we were talking about some of the core things that we would have done working for a company like that. Mm -hmm. And if they're done right, you know, they do actually stand the test of time. These Mm. core strategic planning documents in and around absolutely you know, it's, it's so important to do things properly even if it's a guiding even if it's just a north star and obviously things change along the way but you have to have that north star totally and it, remi- it reminds me that because i think sometimes we do like we produce different things and we're mm. always working on them and sometimes they might sit on a shelf mm. and maybe they might not get used again yeah. but actually i think that's and i think that that's what's irreplaceable as well to your original question about how technology can change things um, we do have to invest the time in creating these really, really important planning documents for different scenarios because, mm. you know, we know the world is changing on a continual basis. So it should come as no surprise that an adverse um, impact might come towards our communities, um, our organizations, our people or even our leadership teams. Well, I love the, you know, the um, axiom, you know, good, you know, bad companies don't survive a crisis. Uh, good companies, you know, get over a crisis and great companies are better after a crisis, you know, so and that's back to what you're saying about the planning and the, you know, having those strategies in place, even if you if they're kind of tweaked and things, it's just that people know there's a plan and, you know, the plans can change, but at least just having that preparedness makes all the difference. A hundred percent. And so so I think, you know, I I feel like, um, you know, I've I've really been very lucky to have met all of these people yeah. along the way. And I, I, I keep them with me. I do. I like I keep in touch with them. Mm. Um, and well, I love what you said about being a gentle presence. I, I think that's really powerful. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's gosh, such a a great a great kind of way to think about how you bring value and you know that's it's not about us yeah it's about our clients yeah it should never be about us mm-hmm. um and I think that's that's the point I think um especially when it comes to PR we sometimes get a bit of a bad rap yeah what value do we add in the room why are we here the reality is is that we're there in those incredibly difficult and mm-hmm. challenging moments um we're there to keep it cool and, and we get paid to be to worry and be paranoid and, and think about all the worst case scenarios and make sure i would that go with anticipate. anticipate i would we anticipate <laughs> yes. i wouldn't say worried or annoyed <laughs> um there was a period of time there recently where there was a bit of change that for me wasn't unexpected but i did say to one of my colleagues and i said i said i've had the best night's sleep in the last couple of weeks i said this is nothing i said absolutely you know i am not surprised at that xyz might happen because You'd be you'd be kind of foolish to live. I went on this yoga <laughs> yoga retreat in the north of Italy once. He said, "If we were all sitting around smiling and happy all the time, well, that would just be a it very strange be, world, wouldn't it?" And very boring. So, yeah. so we do have to think about what might happen, and it's but it's, it isn't about like that moment where uh, a crisis happens and you're freaking out about it. No. It's about the solution. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. necessarily like problem identification is incredibly important, but it's really about how you act and exactly. how, you, how you find the solution. 
And what's simply, in your control? What you do next? Totally. And the, and the level of compassion and care you build into that is central, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, because it's people at the heart of everything at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And what does success? OK, you've achieved a remarkable level of success and you're all you're still extremely young. I mean, you're not, you know, even 40. So it's amazing. <laughs> um, what does success mean to you now? I mean, earlier on in your career, you said that it was just about next, next, next. What yes. does it mean now? It's staying power now. It's important. Um, you know, we're a private company um, and I think I resisted a number of um, people encouraging me to take on investors, um, raise money, um, scale quickly. Um, and I think success is actually about being and being intimate with our clients, being intimate, you know, with their needs and what they have in front of them, um, being subject matter experts. Um, and then on top of that, I think it's also about just um, developing our team mm -hmm. who are going out. And what's lovely is we have a couple of them who are on secondments in different European cities at the moment. And it just warms my heart to see them going out to the different cities <laughs> and attending fashion weeks in Milan or going down to Lisbon for different, you know, blockchain conferences that are happening in November. And, you know, I don't have to travel to these places, which is cool. So I'm kind of sending them out as ambassadors and seeing them develop. So success for me now is actually how do you build an enduring brand mm -hmm. that stands the test of time? I've seen a number of public relations firms be sold recently. And um, and looking at those things, it's, it's really interesting because I thought it was about the money at one stage. Um, and actually, no, it isn't. It's This is very much my vocation and this is my career. And this definitely has to endure for the duration of my career because I don't want to work for anyone else. No. <laughs> so, so it's a long, it's a long path ahead. I think so. Of, yeah. I think so. You know, look, I, you know, I've had the pleasure of getting to work directly with Richard Edelman at different stages of my career. Um, and that's I, funny, yeah, because you used to work there and then I used to work they there became and then your I, client. I became in a different, uh, a unique situation I won't go into. I, yeah. I became their client in New York and it was... You know, it was great to meet a hero and to see who has built and scaled an agency. I also think back to Camilo, Camilo Dabo mm. and Lucy here in, in the Middle East. You know, like it takes something to build an agency. It really does. It really yeah. does. It really, You've really does. You've got to have grit. Yeah. I mean, and then you to look at either, you know, any of those types of organizations, um, the scale of them. I think you can be up there at that level and have so much going on. I think there's a sweet spot um in the numbers traditionally boutique has offered something that clients really want and there is a time that the scale goes past the point of boutique i may be changing my mind at some stage but i feel that where we are right now is possibly one of the nicest positions to be in it's a successful business it is it's got its fingers in the most exciting technologies around the world mm -hmm. we have clients from hong kong to Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. we are well networked with emerging tech founders, venture capitalists, disruptive corporate uh, corporate players, and we're present at the World Economic Forum, places like the FII and mm. in, in in Riyadh, um, and you know I think we just want to continue to deepen those ties, and continue to be relevant mm -hmm. because the more relevant we are with the technologies the more relevant we will be to prospective clients. But ultimately, who's the most important person for us as a service provider? It's the journalists. You know, if we're not coming to journalists with interesting opportunities and stories, we'll lose the magic sauce very of quickly. Yeah. So so I, I, I think longevity is actually, like if I look at the anti-aging properties and all that, I think it's stamina and being able to keep going. Mm. And, um, and I'm actually really ready for that now. It's, it's definitely not a sprint. It was a sprint that got me to year five. For us as a company, um, it's going to be a totally different type of energy now in years five to ten and beyond. Mm. And it's still you're still headquartered in Dublin, but you're going to headquartered in Dublin. We have an infrastructure we've been building so that we can actually build our teams. We do want to be remote first. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Dublin is kind of the beating heart, but it's not. It's it, it, it isn't. I mean, I am actually more in Dubai and then, Milan yeah. than I would be probably in in, in Dublin. Um, uh, and it's just because you follow where the clients need you. Um, I can't help it. But every time that I come back to Dubai and I see all my friends here and catch up with everything, I'm just astounded by the pace of development in the United Arab Emirates. It's, it's just crazy. incredible. Yeah. 
and even the stuff that's happening now down in Saudi Arabia, you know, mm. it's just phenomenal. It's super exciting. It is. And and this year we were in Tokyo for WebEx. Um, and no matter what people say about Web3 and maybe there being some kind of, you know, let's say some regulators in the US and in Europe per se are not necessarily getting their head around the technology. Mm. There's absolutely no doubt that in Asia it's pushing forward. Mm-hmm. You know, we had the Prime Minister of Japan opening the WebEx conference um, saying that they he saw Web3 as a, a key form of the new form of global capitalism. So to have a G8, I think it's a G8 nation, um, saying that an opening of a conference is pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think in Asia there's been a great sense of build it and then we'll figure it out. Mm. And I think Dubai, Abu Dhabi in particular, these have become fervent grounds of innovation mm-hmm. and they will continue to drive forward because they understand it. They You have to experiment in order to build these things. And these founders need a home. Well, I think even th- here, the, it was one of the first countries in the world to have a ministry of AI way before... Five years ago. Yeah, before Five anybody years else. Yeah. And I remember people laughing at it. Yeah. I remember people ridiculing it. Mm-hmm. And and I think AI has been absolutely fascinating because, you know, I've I've personally invested in a company that raised close to $10 million in 48 hours. That's insane. You know, and like it was kind of at first, you know, people, you know, definitely Web3 was not moving at that speed. Um, but now this AI piece has been phenomenal and they did have the foresight. They mm-hmm. saw it. Mm-hmm. And actually, as you walked around Jitex, I can't remember which hall, I think it was the kind of the smart cities one yesterday. And you look at the types of things that they're exploring. It's just mesmerizing. Um, and I really do hope that some of our countries back in Europe will learn gotcha. from yeah. what, what uh, advanced technology can bring. Um, Sean, do you have any uh, regrets? This Professionally? Just whatever comes to mind. <laughs> I would say, so I, I suppose um, when I, I suppose the charging forward and always being consumed with next. Not enjoying the not present. Not enjoying the present in the moment is something that um, I don't feel too bad about it. But no. I, I know that for the next period of my life, you that, that is like definitely that. what I'll be focusing on. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well, I think, is that to start a company is a very vulnerable thing to do. And I suppose if I had had a co-founder at that beginning, I think that would have been a really enjoyable experience to share that mm-hmm. um, that journey with. If it had been the right person. I yeah. think so, yeah, I think so. But also there was a lot of self-doubt in that early period. So you kind of like, you really needed to have someone that you could say, well, let's do this together. Yes. And it's a big risk to start a company or it to really quit a is. job or whatever. And I was lucky enough to do it and I did it in my own way. But I suppose if I went all over again, I probably would think about, you know, working with... With a co-founder. Work, working with a co-founder yeah. because... I do think you share the responsibility and it's, mm. there's joy in that. Of course, yeah. If there's you joy in the that. Right. There is a little bit of kind of like, as you're working through it, my, my, you know, my team are absolutely outstanding and we've had fantastic colleagues along the way. But I suppose it's just at that beginning, I would say to any founder, if you can find a co-founder to work with you who has complementary skills to you at the beginning, and it has to be at the beginning. beginning yeah. It has to be at the beginning. Yeah. That shared experience, mm. there's a great amount of joy in it. And I, I observe it and, and I don't think it's insurmountable to do a company on your own. I've done it. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it, mine isn't a technology company. It's a professional services company. Mm-hmm. So it isn't exactly rocket mm-hmm. science. You know, I, it has been done before. <laughs> but it takes a gentle presence. <laughs> it takes yeah. a gentle presence. Poco uh, a poco. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you, uh, just kind of to wrap up the interview, what you're most proud of. So the work that I am most proud of, I would say, is that building, I suppose, bridges between disparate communities. Um, We worked on a couple of quite confidential initiatives, um, promoting dialogue between people who didn't necessarily want to speak to each other. Okay. And for a period of time, um, I was traveling all over the world, um, meeting with different stakeholders and trying to convince them to get to different places and negotiating with them. I love that because just not to interrupt you, but I just think that that's a role that people don't understand when you're saying that you work in public relations, because really our job is uh, we function as connectors as well. We connect people. Totally. And I did a master's in diplomacy in the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University College London. 
And I really felt that that course helped kind of professionalize and formalize that kind of diplomacy as a service mm-hmm. that we provide. And, you know, I won't go into the details no. on it, but let's just say that it, it was groups of people who had absolutely no motivation to work together. And we actually had to find the things that brought them together, the common threads that actually brought them together. And it was incredibly gratifying to ha- play a small role in that. There's one lady in particular, and I'm not going to mention her name either, but she'll know who she is, um, who is central to all of that. And she trusted me with um, the, the the task. A great responsibility. A great responsibility. And, um, and you know, as a as a true practitioner, we'd never talk about our client work. So of I, course. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thanks for sharing <laughs> that part. Is that, that's really interesting. And it's a really great, uh, another great case study because it really shows how, you know, the service public relations can provide is not, it just goes beyond media relations as well. Oh, it's totally. all about. But one, one, one of my, my dearest Christine Wood said to me, you're only as good as the journalist relationships you have. And so sometimes there's a tendency to move away from those mm-hmm. as you get more senior. Mm-hmm. I, I think I it's the opposite. I completely agree. Yeah, I've, keep, I've, keep it, keep in there, keep the hustle. They're very important people and I love the jive. I, I love to be challenged by them. I have, I've heard um, some kind of p- pure senior, quite senior people in the industry say, oh, I don't even pitch anymore. You know, I never pitch anymore. I mean, I, I still pitch all the time, but I never want to not pitch, you know, because um, it's all about if you can't pitch a story, then I don't know if you can't get someone to, you know, to kind of see what you're, the story that you're telling and believe in it as well. Um, I don't think you're worth your salt in this industry. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's hard sometimes in, in certain markets because uh, there, if it's transient, some journalists can move around. But like you said, you'll meet them again, you know, they'll be somewhere else. And if they keep going in their careers, it's a long, it's a long career you, you and you'll do. see them. And I should apologize to anybody watching or listening to this when two Irish people come together, some Irishisms come out like a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Is that an Irishism? <laughs> I, I didn't even know I that. I think we've been pretty good. We haven't I said think any. Been okay. <laughs> I'm, my father will probably be counting the amount of ums I said on the, on the oh, podcast. Oh yeah, my mom does that all the time. She says, you're, you're doing mm too much. Like, <laughs> <it's> like, okay. <laughs> um, but that's a, yeah, a hundred percent. I didn't know that's an Irish one. I feel it, it is. It's, it probably yeah, is. It's probably is yeah. I mean, you don't even, I don't it even know. It means affirmative. It's like, I, I agree. A hundred percent. Okay, well, we brought the with the green with us, exactly. and um, I hope you know. I guess we talk very fast as well because we're both from. We do. Yeah, we're speaking quite quickly, so hopefully everyone can can get what we're saying. But it's been a real pleasure to Absolute have you pleasure. on. Thank I'm you. really honoured that you came on, John. And Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing. You know, like the whole story of how you founded CWA, and I'm really excited to see what the next five it's years is going to bring. I'm really looking forward to to, um, seeing all the great things that you're doing with your podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Sean. Thank Thank you. you.